should end we mean you. Hello everybody again, uh, my name is Aaron Leggett, I am the president of the Native Village of Kludna. The Native Village of Kludna is the only federally recognized tribe here in the municipality of Anchorage and uh, most of South Central Alaska is my people, uh, the Dena'ina's traditional homeland. Uh, it's my honor to welcome you uh, here today uh, to talk a little bit about the Indigenous Place Names Project, a project that I've been working on with the Anchorage Park Foundation and many community partners for a number of years, and we've got a wonderful film that documents uh, some of this hard work. So I hope everybody enjoys the film, and then after the film and a performance by George Holly, uh, we will have a panel discussion to, little, to talk a little bit about the project and some of the uh, impetus behind it. So uh, thank you all for coming out here tonight, and uh, enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Yachgitzi George Holly at on Athabaskan, Norwegian. I grew up in Soldatna, the banks of the Kenai River. And um, well, I'm just so very grateful to be here. Um, I got involved in this project through Melissa and through her artwork as she invited me. And um, I've been a real benefactor of the Dena'ina people and language uh, growing up in Soldatna, though my family is from the Lower Yukon River. So um, there's something that, uh, that I wanted to just share just prior, and that is that I feel like um, that my interaction um, with native language um, has much been in, through Juno growing up from not necessarily growing up, but I did spend 17 years there, where I did uh, develop a, a kind of an ethic, I think, of um, not only you see that we each have a responsibility for our own languages, to our own people, and yet I do feel that we have a responsibility to support the languages of the place that we live. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, there's, there's one thing that I do feel about um, all of our indigenous languages across Alaska. You know, some might characterize some languages, the languages of love, the languages of science, technology, and so forth. And yet I feel about our indigenous languages, especially here in Alaska, are languages of good character. They lift us all up. So, um, what you'll hear in the film, I'll let that speak for itself. Um, they, there are words that were um, composed much on the spot, um, having to do with the names of the artwork that was involved and through a prayer of a friend of ours, Tanita, um, who said, Makutani um, Nainte, O Creator, guide us. I'm just coming here from um, Zantikihini, from Juno, just today. And um, I'm here for a high convention here this weekend. And um, I'm so happy to be able to join you. One of the projects that I've been working on there is lifting up the local language um, and the place names. And I was asked to write a song for what is formerly known as River Bend Elementary. And yet um, it was named, renamed after uh, a place just nearby, a confluence of the Montana Creek and Mendenhall River. And Kachtagawuhin is, um, it means clear water, which is that very creek. And this is to give you an example then of how I believe that our, our indigenous languages are languages of good character. Because how, it is, how is it then that a school, a public space, would get to uh, be able to project such thoughts in the world as these words, except that, um, that we support the indigenous people, the place that we live, 
the phrase is These are the words of the school song that the kids are just this week just learning for the first time. And it says, let your spirits, let your mind, let your inner selves be as the water that has settled itself clear. Collection librarian since 2019, and I grew up here and I thought I knew so much about Alaska, and the things I've learned in just the last five to ten years have, you know, I, I don't think I've, I could have imagined as a child the things I, had, I didn't know yet. Um, so I'm very grateful to be in this place and to be in this position and to help with these projects. It's such an honor. Um, I do have to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way. We do have emergency exits. There's one over here to your right behind you, one over here to your left. Should sirens and loud noises occur, please find your nearest exit. Um, our restrooms are back up to the main entrance here and to your right. There's also a water fountain there. Without further ado, I really want to uh, move the evening forward. So, Beth Northland. You are up. Thank you. Hello, welcome. I'm Beth Nordland, Executive Director of the Anchorage Park Foundation. I am walking on Denina land. Um, welcome everyone. It's so good to see you. Um, I have the honor of doing a lot of thanking this evening before we move into our panel. So um, thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you to our champions that have been involved with the indigenous placemaking movement from the beginning, and our funders that have been joining and helping us along the way. And here I go with some thanking, all right? Okay, Anchorage Park Foundation and the native village of Aklutna. Um, we have a board member tonight from the Anchorage Park Foundation, Kelsey Potvin, so welcome and thank you for supporting us. The Anchorage Museum, the Rasmussen Foundation, the Alaska Native Heritage Center, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Alaska Humanities Forum, the Municipality of Anchorage through its Federal CARES Act, and also the Municipality of Anchorage from just supporting us on our public lands with their work, Cook Inlet Housing Authority, 
the National Recreation and Park Association, the Siri Foundation, Atwood Foundation. We have Ira Perman with us tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, funders Joe Maholsky, S. Hollis Mickey, Cook Inlet Regional Inc., uh, Michael Fredericks with SALT. Thank you for coming tonight. And Arthur Jensen with Total View, who has worked so hard on our digital mapping, which you will love. And Amugup Media. Ooh, hope I said that right. So thank you. Without further ado, those are all my thanks for this evening. Um, you are welcome to join us to learn more about our indigenous placemaking movement here in Anchorage at anchorageparkfoundation.org and um, learn more at this panel this evening. So thank you so much. bring it up, meaning the video while I talk a little bit. Hi, my name is Alyssa Yachiri London. Klinget Ayahat Yachiriadi Yohat Duasauk, Chak Nahatsati, Dachloidi Ayahat, Angun Kwan Ayahat. And Klinget, I said that um, I'm from the um, Eagle Killerwell clan and that my family is from the uh, village of Angun and that I'm Klinket and my Klinket name Yachiriadi means valuable child. I create a culture story because I wanted to showcase the vitality of indigenous culture today. Um, but my life journey as a mixed race indigenous woman has been that of trying to understand the future of indigenous people and how our cultures can continue to live on. So culture story started out with specifically focusing on indigenous people today, but it has brought into also just asking the question of identity. Who are you today? Where are you going? And where have you come from? And I invite all of you as you watch this video to think about your own cult culture story and think about your culture and heritage and all the parts that make you who you are. And so as I ask questions of the panelists and also as you see me as the host in this video, ask questions of the people who tend to also be the panelists, but as the people that are featured in this video, you'll see the theme of identity come through because I am uh, really asking individuals like Aaron, like, wow, how do you want to see the future of your people represented throughout Anchorage? And that's one of the reasons why indigenous place naming is so important is because it helps uh, native people today and in the future feel seen because their heritage is recognized. Uh, so many people to thank um, who made this possible. Ira Perman, thank you for always believing in the uh, vision of Culture Story. And thank you so much. <laughs> Um, yes, we can give him a round of applause. <laughs> but seriously, there was, I think it was a COVID summer and I called him up and I was in Valdez and I was sharing this vision of these videos I wanted to make and he was just so encouraging. It really meant a lot and he's just made so many introductions. Um, Rasmussen Foundation for the Individual Artists Award that I also utilized to make this happen. Um, I, oh goodness. The, the Alaska Native Heritage Center C couldn't have done it without um, you guys either, and the belief that you know Emily Edenshaw has in the uh, the future of cultural tourism for our state and the future cultural tourism for Anchorage, which this video also hopes to highlight. Uh, Hannah Pratt, <laughs> thank. You. Let's give her a round of applause. She is the editor of this video and she's a joy to work with and I couldn't have done it without you and thank you so much for all of your tireless hours to make this possible by the deadline of the U.S. Department of Education <laughs> grant deadline that was at the end of the year. Um, and Gary uh, of Thompson PR, thank you also for always believing in Culture Story and in my visions and all the panelists, Michael. Um, all the, thank you so much to everyone. Give yourselves all a round of applause. This video means a lot to me and it's just the beginning of Culture Story. And thank you, Sarah, for helping me with the research now for this video and then ongoing. Uh, it's a foundation of all of these videos. language, tell that story, and then it'll be a permanent record of what you
you know about that thing that happened so long ago? This is Culture Stories. I'm Alyssa Yakudi London, a Clinket woman who is passionate about exploring the contemporary lives of indigenous people in today's globalized world. Today, we want to recognize that we are on Denina Aklutna Athabascan land. And this is a culture story about the indigenous place names movement here in Anchorage, Alaska. The indigenous place names movement has been years in the making in an effort to create a city that honors the indigenous place in order to reclaim the identity and heritage of the first peoples of these lands. This ensures future generations grow up knowing who they are and where they come from. And in this episode, we attend a ceremony of the unveiling of the first place marker that reclaims the original place name of Chonsnew, which for many years prior had been called Westchester Lagoon and Chester Creek. This is a culture story about the indigenous place names movement of Alaska. We are on Denina Aklutna at the Baskin land, and this is Denina Elena. The Denina are part of an Athabascan ethnic group that have continuously inhabited this area since time immemorial. This is Erin Leggett, the senior curator of Alaska history and indigenous culture at the Anchorage Museum and the chief of the native tribe of Aklutna. This is our home, this is our village. If you were from rural Alaska or some other place, you know, you have that rural characteristics. We didn't have that. And so, although we have all the modern conveniences, it, it was hard to imagine what this place looked like before the modern city. What did it do to your identity growing up, not having the indigenous place names recognized in the city that you were living in? Well, it was deeply confusing for me. There was no talk of our people. You know, there might be a passing message, oh, the Indians live out in Aklutna, go see the cemetery. But it wasn't presented as anything like a living, breathing culture. When I started at the Alaska Native Heritage Center when I was 19, I met other, for the first time, predominantly uh, indigenous people. Some had grown up in Anchorage, some had grown up in villages. Nobody even knew who we were, not even, what, 10 years ago, when I would say that I'm Denina. They're like, who's that? It's like. Well, actually, where you're at is where we're traditionally from. And it's like, oh, there's actually natives here? Like, yes, there is, and yes, there was. Uh, and we've always been here. And kind of the light bulb went off in my brain that if other indigenous people didn't know that this was an indigenous place, then how would the average person from Alaska or visitor? That confusion eventually prompted Aaron to go on his own journey of self-discovery, which led him to a book called Shem Pete's Alaska. I discovered this book when I was, I don't know, 19. And for the first time, seeing all these place names and seeing the histories, it started to come alive. Shem was an eyewitness to the founding of Anchorage in, in 1915. He was here at the very, very beginning. He traveled all over the Cook Inlet area and knew 650 Denina Athabascan place names. Jim is one of the two authors that spent years working with Shem Pete and other Denina elders to preserve and perpetuate their knowledge for years to come. He would sit and tell us stories and give us names because he wanted them preserved and he wanted people to learn from them. And then what he'd say at the end quite a bit is, who's going to tell you this when I'm gone? Nobody. So today, uh, down at Chanchnu, Chanchnu meaning Grass Creek, uh, we're at Westchester Lagoon, and we're about to unveil a sign as part of an indigenous place names site marker project throughout the Anchorage Bowl. The project aims to accurately and beautifully highlight the culture and history of the Anchorage area's indigenous people through place markers like this one that are built to last. Well, you know that place they call Chester? That's Chanchnu and it was anglicized into. To, into Chester. So people might wonder, you know, who the heck was Chester? Right. Well, there was no Chester. It's Chanchnu. When you were starting this project, what was like the instigation of it? Like what was the catalyst? What were the conversations that were happening? We were developing a, 
a suite of wayfinding signs, I called up Aaron and said, don't you have a list of places that would be important for us to put up interpretive signs? Without that level of expertise, we wouldn't have anything to really be talking about here. But we can also accept federal funding, there and we can accept... There was only one place in the entire city where the Denina were even mentioned. And it said two things about the Denina. One, that they hadn't been here very long before the Russians arrived, and that most of them had died. And the second one is partially true because there were a series of epidemics. But the first allegation that the Denina really hadn't been here very long is totally false. And what shows that in part is the archeology, span but also the place names that there are so many names with such detail and, and such knowledge. And one of those names is what was uh, yes. celebrated today. Today is really great in that it memorializes the Denina name for Chester Creek. You are walking on Denina land. Hey, 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 uh. There was a lot of work and collaboration that even took place just to lead up to the celebration. And we're going to go talk to one of those key people. Michael has been instrumental in organizing all the moving pieces to make this project possible. Her dedication to this work is because she is passionate about changing people's ideas of the history of this place. As a Native person, like why is having the places, the actual physical locations that you interact with in your city, why is that important to your identity? My experiences as a child were feeling bad about my culture, feeling like I didn't fit into either the native culture or the dominant culture. My mother is, you know, from, she's of German descent. So I, my identity was really confusing as a child because it wasn't something that was honored to be native. And I think that a lot of people on that committee felt that too in different ways. And now, today, it is something that we're honoring. And I think that has a large impact on sort of thinking about how can we extend this out into popular culture, not only you know, for Native people, but for everyone. This is a Denina place name project, and I'm not Denina, but I feel that you know, it translates to me. It's easy to understand how honoring one culture can, can help my identity and build my identity. Can you tell me more about the stakeholder engagement and all the people you have to bring to the table in order to make something like a Place Names movement happen? I think the real way to make something indigenous is to have a lot of consultation and engagement with people that are bearers of that culture. The Leopold, or what is now known as Anchorage, is a native place. The Nina people have been caring for this place for thousands of years. What was really special about this project is that it was done in collaboration. It's part of that collaboration, part of being like at the table, making these decisions, you know, uh, with Degleacock, with this place that I that I live, that I am from. This is indigenous land, and this is part of who I am. So seeing myself represented, I think that it allows our community to um, see itself differently as a place that needs to be inclusive of everyone, that needs to recognize indigenous history as, as truly the, the first history. Melissa is an Atna artist and has been a big advocate for acknowledging the indigenous place names throughout Anchorage and had the opportunity to design the Chon's new place marker. We really wanted something that was going to represent thousands and thousands of years of indigenous stewardship, as well as sort of highlight indigenous languages and why that's so important here. You know, the fire bag is what we decided uh, upon to be our symbol. Fire bags were traditionally um, held by indigenous leaders, you know, what would be considered like wealthy individuals. And wealth in indigenous culture and Denina culture specifically is represented in your ability to care for someone. The fire bag just seemed to be the most appropriate symbol. So what does this placemaking sign mean to you and the kids that you teach? I'm trying to teach the kids about our ways, and it's really hard when there's not much media, not much representation, when we are that representation. And so to be able to point to something that has our language on it, I mean, gives them some type of reference. While people may wonder who Mr. Chester was, in fact, there wasn't a man by that name. It was anglicized from the Denina name of Chonsnu. And now this grassy creek that runs throughout Anchorage 
is once again known by its original name. This was memorialized by a celebratory ceremony dedicated to the Dena'ina people who continue to live and thrive here. So what do you hope that this project does for other Alaska Native people, for youth? What are some of the goals of this project? Well, I think we were hoping for this project that it be replicated around the state and even around the country. As far as, you know, modern cities go, Anchorage is one of the youngest. And so uh, we're able to think about the fact that within, you know, three generations, how much has changed, but also the indigenous values, uh, the respect for the land, and uh, the, the ability to share our history is important, especially, I think, for young people who often uh, struggle with their identity in this, you know, modern world. The effort behind the Indigenous Place Names movement and the ceremony that took place today hopes to help future generations of Dena'ina people feel connected to their homelands and thus their heritage. Thank you for watching Culture Stories. I hope that you are inspired to contemplate your own identity and the connection to the place you're from and to those who came before you. Gunashish, thank you. I'm your host, Alyssa Yahya D. London, and this is Culture Stories. long list there's a lot of people to thank and so I'd like to have our panelists come up and we'll hear a little bit more about the Indigenous Place Days movement and their work. So we're going to start off with some questions that we had planned and then we're going to uh, make it available to the audience to ask some questions too. First off, let's have everyone introduce themselves since your mic should be hot. Um, Aaron, can we start with you? Sure. Can you introduce yourself again oh. to the audience? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everybody. Again, my name is Aaron Leggett. I'm the uh, Senior Curator of Alaska History and Indigenous Culture at the Anchorage Museum. I'm also the president of the Native Village of Eklutna and I've been involved with a lot of various projects around Anchorage and about getting uh, Dena'ina heritage and representation here in the city. Thank you for all that you do. I'm Caribou and Fish Eater Clan from Night Dena'ina or Chikulun Village and uh, I was the participating artist on this project and uh, and my cousin, <laughs> and yeah. Oh, Waka, Winga, Aka, Nikki Graham, Aga Aska. Um, my name is Nikki Graham. My Yupik name is Aga Aska. I am Yupik, Blackfoot Indian, and Dutch. I'm originally from Homer. Um, I serve as the director of operations for the Alaska Native Heritage Center, and it's really um, an honor to be here. Um, Emily Edenshaw, president and CEO, CEO of Sends Her regards that she couldn't make it tonight. Um, but I'm honestly just humbled to sit on this panel. Um, I cannot take any credit um, for the work it, that has been done to date. Um, so thank you all for your incredible work around this important project. I'm honored to be here tonight to speak on behalf of how indigenous place names tie into cultural tourism. Um, and yeah, Koyana, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Michael Fredericks and I own a small design and facilitation firm called SALT. Um, my family is from the Kaskokum River and my mother is from Kansas. I'm super excited to be here to talk about how this impacts our family. 
Good evening, my name is Jim Fall. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I've worked with uh, Dena'ina people to assist in documenting their history and culture since the late 1970s. I had the privilege of being the co-author with James Carey of Champeats, Alaska, and worked with Susie Jones and Aaron Leggett on the uh, exhibit at the um, Anchorage Museum called Dena'ina Kochel Yashi, the Dena'ina Way of Living. And thanks a lot for including me this evening. Thank you for all the work you've done and continue to do. Now our first question is for Aaron. Tell us how you got started on the Indigenous Place Names Movement and how it led to this project. Okay, well that's, that's kind of a long story. Let's see, uh, the truncated version. So when I was 19, I started working at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. For the first time I met another young Alaska Native people uh, from around the state, some of who had grown up in villages, some who hadn't. Uh, and like in the film that Stephen talks about, when I said I was Denina, people said, what's that? And I said, we're the people from this area. And people said, well, I had no idea that you know Native people lived here, that this was maybe some empty cultural vacuum. And in that moment, I realized that I wanted to change the historical narrative. As Jim talked about in the film, there was only one place, one place in Anchorage where you could see uh, any mention of uh, the Dena'ina people outside of maybe a couple artifacts at the Anchorage Museum. And in 2006, I was fortunate enough to testify for a committee that was put together for the naming of the new $110 million Civic and Convention Center, uh, and ultimately it became the Dena'ina Center. And when it became the Dena'ina Center, um, it kind of changed the trajectory of, of my life. Not that I wouldn't continue to do this kind of work, but things that I thought that maybe we would get one a decade uh, were happening every year. And so my work at the Alaska Native Heritage Center as a cultural, a Dena'ina cultural historian and at the Anchorage Museum and working with Jim Fall and Susie Jones on Dena'ina Kuchkul Yashi, where we brought uh, about 200 Dena'ina objects from around the world and put together the, the book that really has um, an encyclopedic amount of information about the people um, all kind of came together. But specifically for this project, uh, in some of that earlier work I'd met Beth Northland and we had kept having conversations and now the years are getting kind of fuzzy here, but probably five or six years ago she, she approached me and said, you know, um, I really want to do something around indigenous place names and like she said in the film, do you have a list? And I said, well, yeah, we can put together a list, but I think it's important that we put this committee together, that we get community stakeholders from a variety of uh, institutions. And I think the success of this project uh, really is around those meetings with the stakeholders, working with indigenous artists, uh, so that we have a lot of community buy-in uh, for the project. Thank you, Aaron. I love the topic. I also love the hugs of the community. Thank you for coming and being in person. It's nice that we're a little bit um, past COVID in a way. Jim, I'd like you to add to what um, Aaron just shared and tell us more about your work that uh, you've been doing for years that led to this and then a bit about Shem Pete and, uh, and how that led to this project too. Sure. I think that the, the current interest and really revitalization of uh, Dena'ina place names in the Upper Cook Inlet area uh, can be traced back to the um, 50 years ago, actually, uh, to the uh, early 1970 when Dr. James Carey of the Alaska Native Language Center began his systematic work uh, to document uh, the Dena'ina language with Peter Kalifornsky, Mike Alex, the late chief of Aklutna, and Shem Pete, and a large number of other elders, none of whom are, are, still, are still with us. Uh, Jim had a special interest in place names and really emphasized uh, how key they were to, uh, to opening up a, a wider understanding of, uh, of history and culture. And I joined him in that effort in the, night, in the late 1970s as a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, working with, uh, especially with Shem Pete, who was an elder, um, not from Anchorage, his, uh, his homeland is the uh, lower Susitna River and Red Shirt Lake, Nancy Lake country, but uh, Shem knew a lot about every place in Upper Cook Inlet. We're working with him, Kath, the late Catherine Nikolai of Talkeetna and others. Um, in 1987, 
uh, Jim and I uh, co-authored Shemkeet's Alaska, the first edition, where we pulled together not just a list, but annotations and stories uh, of about 700 names in, in Upper Cook Inlet. Of that total, Shempete was the sole source of 350 of them and knew about 600. Um, important for this work was our um, realization that um, the, the, this, these names and this knowledge were endangered. And uh, we really need to work quickly to, um, to uh, record them. And Chen emphasizes over and over again, as I said in, in the film, he said, you know, we gotta do this now because when I'm gone, nobody's gonna tell you these things. Uh, but fortunately, because of his insight, uh, his generosity and, and, and his brilliance, really, um, we, we have this. Um, we've done, since then, two um, uh, ad additional editions of Shem Pete's Alaska, adding names, adding photographs, adding, adding stories, uh, with the most recent revised second edition out in 2016. Building upon that um, was a class that um, Aaron and Steve Langman of the University of Alaska Anchorage Anthropology Department and I co-taught I forget the year, 2005, 2006. Yeah, 2005, 2006. Yeah, called uh, uh, Denina uh, Heritage and Representation in Anchorage. And among other things, one of the themes was really the lack of representation of Denina Heritage in Anchorage. And uh, the students designed um, uh, rep interpretive signs, and it really got us thinking more about, about the opportunity for that. And then, of course, also really important was the Denina exhibition, Denina Kuchilyeshi at the museum. Um, and while that was going on, there were some early efforts to, to develop uh, interpretive signs uh, in, in Anchorage. And you can find them if you, if you look uh, on, the, on the Ship Creek Trail, on the Campbell Creek Trail, um, a couple of, there's two now at Westchester Lagoon and, and a few other places. And the current project is really building upon that and I think taking it to an, another level. I, I think that the, the opportunity now to just enhance the um, awareness of, uh, of what we have and what we can do with this information is, uh, is, is, really, is really growing. Um, regarding uh, Chanchnu it, itself, Chester Creek, uh, Shem knew that name, but he didn't talk much about it because it really wasn't within his, his homeland. It was um, the late Mike Alex and the late John Stump, both of the Klugna, who uh, recalled that name. Um, and Bailey Theodore in Kinnick, it was his father, uh, Old Man Theodore or Klugna Theodore, who had a house on uh, Chanchnu, on, on Chester Creek, that uh, he lost uh, when Anchorage was, um, was growing. Uh, and it was Bailey who told me, uh, in no uncertain terms, that the origin of the name, Chester, was Chanchnu, and his family knew that, and it uh, occupied this area as a, a summer fish camp for, for generations. Um, I guess the last thing I'd just like to say is that it seems to me that uh, there's a lot that documents Denina history and culture, stories, oral histories, archaeology, artifacts, and so forth. But place names are really great because um, they really kind of open up a pathway for further and deeper understanding. And all of us can go as far along that path as we want to go. And I do mean all of us, because I think uh, learning about Denina history and culture really enriches the lives of everybody who lives in this city. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Jim. Let's give her a round of applause. Melissa, I'd like to ask you about the artwork and what the Indigenous Place Needs Movement means to you. Um, yeah, so uh, the artwork on, on the, um, the wayfinding signs is a Kostilgui, which is a fire bag, and uh, that translates to in it are things, right? And, and we heard in the film sort of the interpretation of it being a representation of leadership. Um, and you know, being part of this is meant a lot to me. You know, I I grew up in a Denina place. I grew up in in Kenai, um, and I, I've lived in Dalekak and Anchorage for many years now. I'm an Ata person from Chikulun, but I'm related to Denina people. 
you know, um, uh, Grandma Olga Izai, who is, you know, Joel Isaac's uh, beautiful statue down at Ship Creek is my great, great grandma. You know, it's like there's deep roots here. And I think that, you know, my participation, um, I think just sort of reiterates that, you know, reiterates the sort of borderlessness of, of our um, cultures, you know, and I think like seeing these things so visible, it's it's really a you know an honor to be here hearing from you know, from Jim Fall and Aaron about the importance of language because language really is our map and our proof of of our, our time here you know and it shows the kind of history that we have here which is which is so much knowledge and so much awareness of our environment and and how perfectly designed our languages are for this land and really how much our whole community, everyone in the Glyakok and Anchorage has to learn from indigenous languages and from indigenous history. You know, we've been here in a sustainable way for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, I'm not saying we go backwards, but I'm saying that we use that information to go forwards because we've already done it. <laughs> you know, uh, settler, colonial settler, you know, have only been here for a couple hundred years and Dena'ina people have lived here for so long. We have a lot to learn from our language, a lot to learn from our history. And, and that's why we need to learn these things. Everyone here, you know, part of the visibility of having this artwork and having this movement um, is also to sort of reiterate too that uh, making space for everyone to be seen allows us to be able to go forward you know and i think that there's really there's really no going back from that and that we have to sort of embrace this um we have a lot to learn from each other and this is just the beginning thank you melissa <laughs> now michael in the film you talked about how when you were growing up there wasn't uh, indigenous place seems a recognition of the native people of this land and even though you are not from the tribe of this land it means a lot to you to even see the tribe of this land be recognized can you tell us more about why that's important to you and how you and what the future you would like to see um, in Anchorage and for your son so I brought my son so he's there he can hear this firsthand yeah, when I was growing up, and I'm 45, so there you go, that's when I was growing up. Um, my dad was an incredible leader. He ran our tribe, and he ran our regional and uh, village corporation. And he wore suits and went to DC, and then on the weekends, he wore crazy things. Gary and I were laughing about him because he was a neighbor. Uh, to embarrass us as children, that was his drive. But when we'd go out and he'd be wearing those crazy things, people would think that he was a drunk native. And I remember being Max's age and not really understanding what all that was about and thinking, my dad is the most powerful native person all around. Like, how can you say these things and ask us to leave these places? And it was just really complex and I didn't feel like I fit really anywhere. And I was ashamed you know, of that. But I had really, really strong parents and we talked about it um, pretty openly about what, what we were feeling and what we were hearing. And we've gone from, to me in my life, that to my 10 year old thinking he's a superhero because he's indigenous. And hearing Mr. Holly's drum and putting his phone down and saying, that's, I hear that. You know, putting this phone down and saying, I hear that. And just watching this video and pointing to all of you and being so proud to be here and part of it. So he's not going to, he doesn't have those complex identity things. It's just strength and pride. And we're not even from this region. So what will his children think? They will be speaking their language. He's teaching me my language. I'm so proud to hear all my fellow panelists say their words. I'm not there yet. He's teaching me though. 
So for me, when Beth called and said, we need your help, and I went to this meeting with Aaron and uh, Holly from Huddle, who, you know, Huddle did this amazing work to transform this into a thing, and they asked me to be part of this. I had no idea what a journey for me personally this would be, but it's like opened me up to who I am. And to remember uh, that, like Melissa said, being present in that has such power, not only for the Dunaida people, but like Jim said, for every one of us, because we're 10,000 years of struggle and love. We're all that, um, no matter where we come from. So I'm just really proud to be part of this and thankful for being asked and for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to transition to Nikki and ask you about your uh, cultural tourism work with the Alaska Native Heritage Center. So tell us about how this project ties into the cultural tourism work that the Heritage Center is involved in and envisions for the city of Anchorage and beyond. Awesome, thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, wow, an incredible um, panel tonight. Um, I was just really thinking about what Michael was saying and I had a similar ex experience growing up here. And um, I look Caucasian. I've struggled with my identity a lot as a native person because people would say things around me that they might not say around someone who looks more traditionally native. Um, and I was ashamed for a long time and I didn't feel confident to stand up um, for our people um, because I grew up in a native household and I identified as a native person. Um, so I've struggled a lot with my identity and what I think is so cool about this movement, and this will tie into cultural tourism as well, is our connection to our land is who we are, that's our connection to our identity as Alaska Native people. Um, and so just seeing that represented, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago when I was in school, there were no indigenous place names here in Anchorage. I, our people weren't represented. And now we have a place where our kids can see that our cultures are celebrated and there's so much work around preservation and revitalization. It just, it gives me chills. Um, and I'm so grateful my 12 year old niece gets to grow up in a place where we're celebrating our indigenous people. And when people come to this state, you know, yes, Alaska is a beautiful, vast, um, scenic place and we have wonderful brown bears and fishing. Um, but I want every person who comes to this city to know that they are coming to an indigenous place and the importance of recognizing indigenous cultures. And I think there's this national movement where people are, is the term woke, um, but people are becoming more and more awake and curious and wanting to celebrate um, traveling with a purpose is something that's a really big movement. And so, yes, they want to come see the scenery and go on a fishing trip, but they also want to learn about the people from this place, the stewards of this land for thousands of years. Um, and so we welcome them. It's about educating. And at the Heritage Center, we get all of the crazy questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, your people live in igloos and, and everything that you can imagine. And we give grace, and we want to educate, and we want to um, – make our people feel welcome um, and celebrate them coming to this land and make sure that then when they walk away, they know that our people have not only been here in, from time in memoriam, um, but our cultures are thriving. Um, we're not just surviving, we're thriving. And, you know, there are a lot of things that have happened in the past and that's an important part of our story. Um, but there was a time when we couldn't celebrate our cultures, where we couldn't speak our languages. Um, and so this is just a small symbol to me of us taking our power back as Native people and having that visibility and that representation that we need to have. Um, and we know that when people travel for cultural tourism, when they travel for a purpose, they stay longer and they spend more money. That money and those resources go back into our local communities. They go back into programs that preserve and celebrate culture and continue and strengthen language programs and art programs. Um, and so it all has this trickling effect. It also stimulates um, our workforce and creates opportunities for our people um, in the workforce. And so it really just is this holistic, everything is related and everything is interconnected, which is a really important traditional value. 
of Native people. And so um, I just, again, want to say thank you so much for the incredible work that has been done here. Um, this is such an important project, and like I think Melissa said, like this is just the beginning. Um, and I'm just so excited to see where we go from here. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. <laughs> Now with the um, time we have left, I'd like to, I'll come with the mic if anyone has a question they would like to ask of our uh, esteemed panelists. Does anyone have any questions? Elise? Thank you for coming. I feel like I've seen you for years on social media. <laughs> I've been trying to help folks see all of this, but man, I'm just so excited to be here, and thank you to each of you. Um, I wondered if you could share a little bit of your perspective in terms of what your vision is long-term for all of this incredible work. Um, I've been to Hawaii, for example, and seen a lot of this similar, not the same, of course, because it's a different story, different culture story, but I have certainly seen some of what Nikki is talking about and how travelers love to visit. And I guess I have a couple questions. One is about the vision uh, long term. I certainly hope it goes beyond Anchorage. And secondly, um, and I'm not sure who would probably, Aaron would be able to help me with this, um, if you've thought about a sense of balance between growing this awareness and of culture and story and keeping it to be yours as opposed to feeling like it's something that you're selling. Um, and, I, and I know that you're very thoughtful about all of that, but I thought I'd love to hear your perspective about that. Sure, um, I mean, to, to quickly answer your question, it, it's the place name, the markers themselves are just one component. It, it's, uh, websites, it's connecting all the places in Anchorage, it's um, augmented reality probably in the future using technology to map areas, it's uh, connecting with our partners at the Alaska Native Heritage Center, the Downtown Partnership, the Anchorage Museum, um, corporations uh, here in town, uh, curriculum development, uh, I mean this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. As far as your second question about how do we, uh, you know, not exploit it, I think coming back to what what Nikki was talking about, you know, I cut my teeth uh, on tourism, sort of in the classic sense of, of the word. In fact, I started at the Heritage Center because I had a background in tourism, and I could sit here and spout millions of Alaska facts. But what I came to realize is that it, when it's our people telling our story the way we want it told. Um, that's the most important component of it. And I can remember working at the Heritage Center early on and feeling like I didn't have a story uh, to tell because I grew up here in Anchorage and who would want to listen to that? As the years have gone on, I've actually realized that it in some ways became quite a bit of an asset. So I think it's about changing the narrative of how we tell the story of Alaska. It's also related to curriculum development, larger with the, you know Alaska history and the way proper education is being taught uh, in our schools throughout the state. And then to kind of put a bow on it, I would say the other part of the project, the Indigenous Place Name Project, and one of the things that we talked about very early on was we wanted to, we were very transparent about how we developed this process, and it was our hope that this process be replicated across the state, and we will happily share uh, any of those resources of, of how we did it and, and sort of kind of, for lack of a better term, best practices, at least how we, we view it from our, our committee, which um, had a huge amount of community partners, um, many of them mentioned, but not all of them. Thank you, Aaron. Anyone else want to add anything? Um, yeah, I think you, you said it beautifully about it, you know, it be rep that we're representing ourselves and that we're part of it, but it's also that this is also done in community and it's done with a many people is a big part of it because I think too that, um, you know, singular decisions is not really an indigenous way of being either. You know, things were made and made group decisions, you know, and I think too that a big part of doing this so publicly and doing it in front of every one of you 
is, is that I'm hoping that every one of you goes home and starts, you know, using these place names, you know, using the information that's there because that's the thing. It's like if, if this work is only on indigenous people's shoulders, if it's only on native people's responsibility to educate everyone, it's a really heavy burden and it's also a lot of labor. So the idea is that we're doing it together so we're all lightening that load and we all hold the burden to share and, and teach people. You know, and, uh, and, and, and I think that that's, that's like a really important aspect of that, is that we all take on this and we all learn this thing together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you. Who would like to take that? Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, so the short answer, there's two, two, two governments, basically. You have the state uh, board of geographic names, and there's a whole process, and you've mentioned Suicide Peaks, and right now there's an effort to, uh, to get that name changed. Uh, in some cases, there's ones about reestablishing uh, indigenous place names, sometimes uh, indigenous place names, um, the sort of the English translation gets sort of butchered. Um, a good example of that is across the inlet, there was official renaming of, it used to be called Chakachamna Lake, it's actually Chakajapana. Um, and there's, there's some others, uh, uh, Katsugi Ridge is another one that I know that has changed. It's a long, slow, lengthy process. Uh, I think there's certainly an effort to uh, to do that, I think it, it, it's a huge, as Melissa talked about sometimes, though it's a heavy lift, and it's about prioritizing uh, opportunities, and, and my hope is that, so you brought up um, Mount McKinley and Denali. Uh, most people don't realize that there's been an effort for 100 years to change that name, and it took 100 years to change it. And I'm not saying it should, but that's just an example of how these things don't happen necessarily overnight, and that it has to be about building uh, community consensus and um, an embracing of place. So do I hope that someday that it becomes Chanchnu instead of Chester? Absolutely. Will it happen in my lifetime? Maybe. I don't know. Why do you think it's so ubiquitous for uh, Hawaiian place names to be utilized by tourists and locals alike? And where, whereas it's really difficult in Alaska. Well, I think the biggest thing is that in Hawaii you have one language for the entire set of islands. In Alaska we have 21 languages, and if you add dialects, it's over 50. And so, a good example of that actually was, you know, a few years ago, uh, the city of Barrow decided to change its name uh, to Utkiagvik. Well, some of the community members thought that it's not Utkiagvik; it's Utpiagvik, and there's sort of a still an internal debate about whether it's a place where the owls nest or a place where we go and gather berries. And so um, it's complex, I guess, and, and it sort of speaks to the geographic and linguistic and cultural diversity of our state. You know, again, it should also be pointed out that Alaska represents one-fifth the size of the continental United States. And so imagine trying to change everything in the West and all the languages that are there. So it, it's complex. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> One comment I'd like to offer is that um, when we talk about names like Chanchnu and uh, Denali and, and others, um, I think it's a mistake to talk about renaming those places because those are their names. I mean, there's a, there's a whole system, a whole network of, uh, of Athabascan and, and Alaska Native names throughout the state. 
Some of them have been recognized as official names. In, in, in our area, Susitna, Yetnu, Talkeetna, um, Kehiltna, there's, there's, there's plenty of them um, that, that are there, and, and there are others that probably should be elevated to an official status. And another thing to consider, um, because this is a controversial topic, is, uh, as, as you know, is that uh, bilingual countries have bilingual place names. Um, and as the Denaina language or other Alaska Native languages reassert themselves, um, there, there can be dual names. Uh, I'm, I'm a student of Welsh culture, and um, Wales is a bilingual country, and they have bilingual names. You, you look at a, a map, and there's Swansea. That's the English name. But it's Abitawa if you're if you're a Welsh speaker, and, and German uh, not Germany, but um, uh, parts of, of the Netherlands and other places, the same thing. Where there are multiple languages, there's there's multiple place names, and people respect them both. So there's various ways to go. Right? It's, it seems to me, but uh, again, I I don't think when we're bringing forward um, the traditional names of places, we're renaming anything. Those are their Denina names. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to say something really quick too, particularly to you, as you spoke, spoke about it, you know, about art being kind of a, a, a catalyst of it too. This is one process of reclaiming, you know, our original place names. You can do this through art, you can do this through, you know, creating stickers, you can do this in so many ways. I mean, when Aaron and I were working together, we, we may, I was like, Aaron, what, what is the place name of Anchorage? And we're like, well, maybe it's the original town site. Maybe it's Ship Creek. Maybe it's Devaya Clock. And I was in Sheetka this last week, you know, and I heard people using that term, you know. And I'm not saying it's because of that sticker, but, I'm, but I do think that it creates, invis it creates visibility. And you just learning place names, you know, being an equipment tribal citizen is part of the movement and an important part because it doesn't always have to be these official channels. It could be anything that you're, that you're doing, any work that you're doing, efforts, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we have time for any more questions? Sarah? One more? One more? <laughs> um, does anybody want to ask another question? Yes? I, I had one from a uh, from a virtual audience member, so we're really in the 21st century here. Um, what has been the impact, whether it's anecdotal, personal, or other evidence, uh, of the effects it may or may not be having on uh, dynamic communities? I guess that's speaking about the movement in general. So what are the positive and negative effects of, yeah. the, of the movement on Dinaina people? Well, I think real quick, I mean, it's part of a larger effort, but it, it's, you know, I think about my nephews and growing up in a world where we're not invisible. When I grew up, literally, Claire Swan said we were the invisible people. We were invisible to outsiders and we were invisible to ourselves. And I knew that quote and it, it sort of struck home to me in that moment. And it really was true. You know, 15 years ago, if I said to Cotton, there aren't five people in Anchorage that, would, that aren't Denina that would have known what that name is. But now it's out there at both the Cotton Commons and the Cotton Ballroom. And at least there's a passing re recognition that it's a Denina name and it means Big Water River. And it's not just Cook Inlet. Thank you. And I'm not Denina, but I feel like And then all these things started popping up, these things that had been bubbling for so long, and it seemed like this perfect time. So there was, the Denina Center was supposed to have this amazing exhibit inside of it. It's got amazing things, but that came back to the table. And so Jim and Aaron and I are working on that. So that'll come soon. And there's this whole um, downtown wayfinding idea and facade upgrade and in amplifying indigenous identity sort of projects happening everywhere. And just like Melissa says, it's happening at all levels, which is so cool. So there's murals that will come this summer and in the next summers. So it's everywhere. Also, just one quick plug. On the front of this uh, library here is Holly Northland's uh, 
uh, representation of uh, two traditional Denina stories. So it's, you know, it's public art represented in telling a Denina story as well. I also saw that the public library has a storytelling walk that I didn't have anything to do with uh, about a Denina story called Chiam, uh, the Fox Man, that you can see right on the lawn outside. So it's, it's right here as we speak, too. Thank you. Hannah? I'd love it if you would. And um, Derek did all the music for the um, culture story, so thank you so much, Derek. Um, this isn't really a question, more of a comment. Um, I'm really grateful for all the work that you guys are doing. I am not an indigenous person, but I got to work on this project as uh, the editor. And everybody that I told about this, my family, my friends, most of which who are white, uh, were like, wow, that's so cool, that's, that's so inspiring, where are they doing more things like this? I want to go see the place marker, I want to see the film, I want to learn more. And since I started working with Alyssa on Culture Story, I've really dived into Alaska history, specifically Alaska Native history, and the place uh, and Denina land specifically because I grew up here. Um, and it's really changed my perspective of what I say, or what I mean when I say born and raised in Alaska, um, because I understand more about, about the people who came here, who lived here before all of the rest of my people arrived, um, but also understanding how I can think in a more community-minded way uh, as a white person living on Denina land. Um, and I really, really thank you guys for that because having had the opportunity to assist in telling this story, um, I've also been able to tell a lot of other people who might not have otherwise known about this movement um, and other, other fun facts about, about this process. Yes, it's not a question, but thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. The, the question I would pull out of there is actually for Nikki. What are some of the ways even this upcoming summer with the Heritage Center that you hope to impart uh, more Alaska Native knowledge to visitors to our state? Well, um, what I'll say is the Alaska Native Heritage Center is doing some really exciting things and I think it really ties into this project too. I mean, one of the things I'm really, pa I'm an Nelchik Village Tribe member. I'm really excited about drawing attention and partnering and working with our tribes in, in new ways. Um, we represent all of the main cultural groups here in Alaska, um, but for example, one of the big projects we're doing is we're planting an indigenous garden. And so we're gonna be really strategic about what we're going to plant because we're opening an indigenous cafe. And so what is indigenous to myself and what is indigenous to Aaron or Melissa or Michael is different. Right? We grew up with different foods, um, different dances, different experiences. And we want to represent that and tell the story behind food. Um, and so it's native to this land, what we have available here. A lot of it's local, fresh. Like we want to eventually kind of move into maybe doing farm to table. Um, but being inspired by things and telling our story through food. Um, that's something you can't really get in a commercial way here in Anchorage, and we have to be really thoughtful and intentional about that because a lot of our foods are protected. They're for subsistence. We have to honor that that's sacred. Um, but finding ways to tell a story through, like, fry bread um, is not a, a lot traditional Alaska Native dish, um, but it was born from a place in the reservation systems where people were taken out of their home communities and given government rations. And now it's such a seller. People have fry bread at celebrations, at events. Like, it's ingrained in, into our culture. Um, but telling that story to people about why it, it's important and significant to us. Um, and so that's just one of the ways um, the Alaska Hair Native Heritage Center is kind of thinking in the longer term in ways to celebrate things from this land and bring our traditions and share our traditions and also find ways to monetize that. So that that comes back into our communities, that allows us to grow our programs for our youth um, and our elders, and um, it just opens up lots of opportunities. So I'm not sure if I answered your question exactly, but oh, you did. You did a fabulous okay. job. Thank you. And uh, I would like to just give every panelist um, uh, 
final moment to impart some um, knowledge about the Place Things Movement or where you'd like it to go from here, and then we'll close out for the evening. Um, we'll start with Melissa. Um, I, you know, I just want to really, uh, I just really appreciate all of you being here today and listening and hearing, you know, more about this movement. And, you know, I want to say too that, um, that this is for us, you know, that, that it is important for, you know, all of us to understand each other's histories, you know, and understand that, that this history that we're talking about is Alaska's history. <laughs> and it's an extension of something that has, uh, been, you know, widely made invisible. And we're uncovering that, and we're remembering that. And it's it's very valuable and important for our future. And, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's just as important for our visitors to understand what the place name is, but it's so important for our local community members and for all of you who are here in Degoyacock, in Anchorage, and learning about this now. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Jim, do you have any words? Just basically that I'm really looking forward to helping with the, uh, the next several um, sides that uh, I think are in the works. Uh, I think there's one that uh, might be at, uh, it's called Kadi Tali, which is um, Potter Marsh, a place where the lumber washed up, and uh, Anuchish Tunt, which is uh, uh, Point Warrensaw which is an extremely important um, Dena'ina uh, place in, in Anchorage. So I think those are coming up in, in, this, in this process, and I'm looking forward to helping with that. Thank you, Jim. And Michael? Well, that was a good um, opener just to say that there are 32 total places that we're going to honor in um, physical, virtual identity, celebration, education, all these things. And so if you're interested, um, the Parks Foundation has a donation opportunity because they, it's a big project and there is lots to do. Thank you. And Nikki? I'm ashamed to admit this, but until I didn't know what a land acknowledgement was until a few years ago, and I saw Melissa speak actually at the Takotnin Forum, and I felt, now I go to so many meetings where there are land acknowledgements. And I just want to use that as an example as to what I see happening with this movement um, is it starts with something small, right? Now I incorporate them into all of my presentations and, and every meeting I ever start. Um, and so I just see that happening here and I, it's, it's, it might be a, a, it's a small but mighty start and I just see the bigger long-term picture. And so I just thank you all so much. Uh, this is so incredible and I can't wait to just see this really grow. Thank, Thank you, Nikki. And Aaron, can you close us off? Chanan <laughs> <laughs> um, Ganini, thank you. You all came out here today. And it's just, to me, it, this is you know, a culmination of a lot of uh, people's hard work. And I'm just so fortunate to be uh, a conduit to, to help facilitate this. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, when Jim talked about all those elders that aren't with us anymore, that didn't want to see this disappear. They really felt in, that it was important that people know this. And I just, you know, sometimes I wish, you know, they could have only seen what, what we've been able to do. Um, but to me, you know, picking up Shem Beats Alaska, the first edition, and kind of discovering all this information that I didn't, didn't grow up with and didn't know existed, um, sitting on the shelf, I, I knew I had to make it my mission to help facilitate getting that information out there and in some small way uh, being able uh, to do that is really quite exciting because to me, you know, it's about the future and creating uh, a place where, you know, this information is not only known but celebrated and the wisdom, as Melissa said, from thousands of years of some of the trial and error, uh, how we can come together as a community to do things better, I think is what's really important. Thank you, Erin. Let's give the whole panel a round of applause. And thank you all for coming, and thank you, Sarah, and the Anchorage Library for this amazing venue, and just gonna thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>